about the three ethical uh, themes there. We talked about greed, we're talking about lust, and we'll be talking about pride. Um, I'm thinking probably we'll get to it by January. Uh, so just some of the things that we've been talking about. First off, that we are sexual beings. That's something that, I mean, we just need to come to grips with if we really want to um, want to face our demons and, you know, overcome them. Um, and we talked about the, the two different stances that, that's been taken. On the one side, the world is overindulging in sex, and on the other side, the church is ignoring sex, and neither, neither of those solutions are biblical. Um, so we've been talking about the way that um, that we are definitely sexual beings, and, but sex is much more than just sexuality is much more than just sex itself. Um, you know, we were talking about how, how sexuality is, is you know our ability to feel, it's our ability to experience things. Um, it's that um, innate uh, desire to have friends and to uh, communicate, and you know uh, to have something more than just the physical. And we talked about that's the pro main problem with pornography is that it, it doesn't sexualize us enough. It takes the sexuality out of us, and it makes the sex all about just. Um, a, a temporary high rather than that intimacy that, that can be shared um, between a husband and wife. Um, we, all, we talked about critically analyzing articles. We talked about the Gnostic writings. We talked about um, equality between man and woman and, and sexism and that whole problem that was there. Um, we talked about feminism. If you remember, I said very, very clearly, feminism is not the problem. It is if someone has a um, vengeful spirit, that's a problem. Because okay, well, I talked about this last week. I was on this mission to disprove feminism, and then I got halfway through, and I thought, well, that's just not a really good idea because feminism isn't the problem. It's, it's the idea that, that someone is superior to someone else. That's the problem. So anyways, um, not saying that feminists are inherently uh, – uh, what do you say? Uh, <laughs> um, what is it called? Um, Pig-headed, you know. But sometimes when people hear the word feminist, they immediately think, you know, this this guy's an idiot or this chick's an idiot, you know. So, anyways, <clears throat> so I'm I'm gonna try to talk about marriage and uh, singleness um, in equal proportions. If you guys have any questions, make sure to stop me on this. Um, so last last week we were talking about the way that with marriage it, it's a part about equality. Yes, uh, it says about the wife. Um, we talked about this last week about the wife submitting to her husband, but keep in mind that that doesn't mean that the husband gets to do whatever he wants and the wife just has to go along with it. Remember we talked about this last week? Um, so, so the wife is not going to be contentious in spirit, right? And the man's not going to be domineering in spirit, right? Um, and uh, so, okay. So that means that all the decisions need to be made together or not at all. Um, there's this idea as you get married that, that kind of like you have to rush into a, into a decision or that you have to um, speed things along with stuff. And, and the truth is a lot of the times that, that we as married people make decisions, it's decisions that we could have taken our time on in the first place. You know, We don't have to rush into a decision. Um, so with that being said, um, don't feel like just because you and, your, you and your spouse don't see eye to eye on something that you have to rush into something, you can just hold off on the decision. You know? I mean, it kind of goes along with some other things too. Um, but this is something that you should definitely be watching out for while you're dating, uh, for those of you who are single. Um, you want someone who, who values your opinion, because if they don't value your opinion before you get married, that's not going to change after you get married. So. Um, also, we were talking about, about the way that, that, that sex and marriage – remember that verse that, that we talked about uh, where it says, you know, not to withhold – wife, don't withhold your body from your husband, and husband, don't withhold your body from your wife. We were talking about the way that um, – that, that, that's been used in some ways as like a marital rape kind of thing where, where one of the spouses has, has you know, uh, stronger on the other one in, into sex, and it takes away the whole intimacy of it. So uh, along those lines, sex between two, two married people shouldn't, shouldn't be forced. It shouldn't be you shaming somebody into it, and it shouldn't be – they shouldn't feel guilty in there in the process. Marriage is supposed to be about that, that, that connection, that equality. Um, and so that brings up the question, well, so what happens if you want to have sex and your spouse doesn't? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to talk about that next week. <laughs> Built up your hopes there, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about this. Um, the women, women, when it talks about a, a woman submitting herself, it's talking about um, sometimes women have this tendency to just kind of be, well, I don't know what else to say. It's like contentious, uh, um, argumentative. Uh, 
I can't think of a better word right now. And basically the Bible talks about women not doing that. And, and in contrast, because once again, that wasn't that big of a new idea in biblical times. That was kind of like the standard. But what, what was groundbreaking is what Paul said about the man's role. He talked about it in, in a way like this. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. And with that being said, that was kind of a, a revolutionary idea there. It went completely against what the culture expected because, once again, men up here, women down here. And women didn't get say-sos and, and, and things. And so this was kind of like a, a big deal. Um, so anyways, and I don't think that's really changed over the years. Um, even today, women still don't have the same uh, qualities as, as men do. Um, let's see. So it talks about a, a man protecting the wife. It does talk about that. It talks about providing for the wife. Uh, it definitely does talk about that. So I, I want to real quick take a little thank you um, because Gracie and I did this. You know, uh, Gracie remembers, I'm sure, where I didn't work and she did so I could finish school and whatnot. So people always ask, is it a sin then for the wife to work and for the man not to? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Um, that's really not what it's talking about in Genesis. Um, but we talked about this kind of last week. You just want to make sure that you and your spouse are on the same page. Mm -hmm. That you've come to the decision of, of who's working and for how long or for what's, what the main... You see what I mean? Gracie decided <coughs> to stay home and watch Micah. I didn't force her to. She could have stayed at work if she wanted to further her career. That, that would have been totally fine. But we came to mutual understanding. Does that make sense? And that's what the whole marriage thing is about. It's about two people um, discussing things together. See what I mean? And uh, so, um, but in marriage, this is absolutely critical because as a pastor, this is the thing that divides marriages and causes more divorce than anything else. It's not. It's not the pornography. It's not you know this that the other thing. It's this when your spouse does not have a safe place with you. You guys understand what I'm saying? When I don't know how else to say it. When when they feel like their opinion doesn't count. See what I mean? Because when that happens, it starts building up this rift between you guys, and it will it will it will cause other things to happen, like pornography and whatnot. Um, but anyway, so no making fun of, no criticizing, no no hiding things from you. Never want to hide a purchase from your spouse. Never ever ever. You never want to do something behind your spouse's back, especially something you know that they're not gonna like. You know. Um, and I'm trying not to spend too much time on this because, you know, there are a lot of single people here. So, um, And that pretty much covers up what we were talking about over the past couple weeks and I think really transitions well into this. So what should, do you think is a good thing to look for in a spouse? The relationship with God. Okay. Do you want to elaborate any more or is that um, good enough? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Anybody else? How they treat their family. Oh, yeah, buddy. <laughs> because you're going to be their family someday, so chances are they might treat you the same way. <laughs> or they might just break off. Like, it can happen, yeah. It can definitely happen. How their family acts. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Funny story. Not not so funny. Um, <laughs> not, not so funny. Uh, um, from the moment um, Grace and I got together, it's been like a, a, a fight as to me belonging into the family unit. You know what I mean? And uh, so this is a warning for those of you who will one day have kids and for those of you who are looking for a spouse. Your in-laws can definitely make married life hell. And uh doesn't have to be like that, but sometimes it definitely is like that. Definitely is like that. Uh, so good point, Garrett. <laughs> really, really good point there. <laughs> yeah, really good point. Um, I know what they say, you know, love knows, loves, love knows no bounds, but sometimes it definitely strains the relationship. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> How they take care of themselves. Okay, like, what do you mean? Just, like, overall, like, do they... You know, just take care of themselves. Are, they they responsible? Care of their house. Yeah. Are you talking about like responsibility or like cleanliness? Like both. Oh, okay. Just okay. like overall, like what kind of person are they? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I got you. Kind of weed out their priorities. That's a good idea. Yeah. Anybody else? Really good answers, you guys. I'm tipping my hat. <laughs> <laughs> So just some of the ideas that I had, 
Um, how do they react in anger? You definitely want to see them in a real life situation. Um, because when you start dating someone that you don't know, like let's say you just meet this guy, you know, whatever, and, and you start dating, you know that they can hide stuff from you <laughs> and make it really believable. <laughs> um, and, and so obviously you want to see them in a real life situation. How do they react when they get cut off? How do they react when, uh, when something goes wrong with their taxes? How do they react when, um, when you're at the store and somebody, you know, mistreats them or overcharges them? You know, you want to see them in action. How do, how do they actually react in real world? Because I, I can put on a front and look really good in front of people. But the question is, who am I really? You know, so how do they react in anger? Um, how is their family life? Uh, I, this was already brought up. <laughs> I think it definitely goes. Um, and men, you want to look for, if you're a woman looking at a man, you want to look for how he treats his mother. That will oftentimes, oftentimes relate to how, he, how he's going to treat you. And if you're looking for a wife, typically you want to look to see how she treats her husband. I mean, sorry, her father. Her father. <laughs> if, you're for wife, if you're looking for a woman who's already married, it's probably a bad idea. So. <laughs> uh, anyways, but you want to see how she's going to respond to her father because um, – Sometimes in marriage, there's this issue of transference where the husband becomes like a father figure and the um, wife will become like a, a like a child figure for the for the male. Um, and so, because of that reason, you definitely want to watch out for that kind of stuff. But anyways, um, do you know how this? Do you know this person well? Did you did you know them before you dated? These are things you definitely want to ask yourself. Um, obviously, because you know people can hide stuff, people can put on a good facade, but you really want to make sure that you know this person because once again, marriage isn't really something you should take lightly. Um, and so then that raises the question: Well, should you casually date? And I really don't have an opinion of this. If if it's your thing and you feel comfortable, if you don't feel comfortable with it, then don't. Um, but I think that if you do casually date, you should definitely make your intentions known at the beginning of the dating process that you see this as a casual relationship. The internet is full of, of examples of people who thought the relationship was a lot more serious than it was. <laughs> a lot more serious than it was. I was actually reading this funny story. Um, there was this woman who was dating this guy for uh, three plus years, and he kept asking, and like she kept saying no, and so he planned out this whole like uh, vacation to Disneyland of all places. Like, what is she six? <laughs> but anyways, to Disneyland to, to ask her, and he knew, and she knew that this was going to happen, and she stopped and asked herself, wait. I know this is going nowhere, and this guy clearly wants it to go somewhere else, and it's been three years. Maybe I should just cut ties, and she did. Make things a lot more simple. So anyways, um, you definitely want to ask yourself that. And, and just because I deal with a lot of uh, teenagers who ask me this, how do you know when you've known them long enough? Well, has it been three weeks or three years? Because teenagers are masters of doing this. They they kind of hop from from pe person that they're completely enamored with to another person that they're completely enamored with in the matter of just a few weeks. So obviously, you know, if you're in a high school, you probably don't want to be dating that seriously. Probably there's a lot of life left left to do before you tie it down. But anyways, uh, so just something to think about there. Um, are they a Christian? Do you sh share the same foundational views? Obviously, this is going to be a huge problem because our Christianity is the core of who we are. That's like, you know, um, if your spouse dated for, you know, Trump and you, I mean, voted for Trump and you voted for, for Clinton, I mean, obviously that's going to cause a huge rift between you. So it's kind of that, that idea that the foundational issues, do you guys agree on a lot of stuff? Because after the whole romance and honeymoon part is gone, you have another human being that you're living with. And that other human being has their own character flaws, their own dreams, their own passions. And you have to stop and ask yourself before you tie the knot, is this going to be something that it conflicts with my dreams and passions? Is this something that I'm willing to give up for this person? Is this something that I should give up for this person? See what I mean? Like let's say God says, hey, you should be a missionary to Mexico. And so you meet this guy and he's like, hey, I hate Jesus. And you probably shouldn't marry him because he's not going to want to go to Mexico to minister to people. Just throwing that out there. Um, do they share the same foundational views? Um, do you like who they are or what they could be? Sometimes, especially, I notice this more with women than men, they get this idea of, he could be a good guy. I could train him. Uh, he could change. I could change him. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, the grand majority of times, people are not going to change like that. Who you marry is who you're stuck with. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to sound like dark like that, but the grand majority of the times, you, your, your partner isn't going to change that much. If you marry a, a, a woman abuser... He's probably going to abuse you when you're married. I mean, it, it, chances are he's not going to change. And you see this a lot with, especially um, 
at least in this area, um, a lot of the people who are in abusive relationships, well, I, I love him and, 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 and I think he needs me. And it's like, yes, I, I get that, but this is unhealthy. You know, This is an abusive relationship and you need help because you are definitely being abused and your life is in danger. What's really bad is, is when they uh, keep the kids there too. So the kids get abused and they're sexually assaulted and whatnot. And, and they, obviously there's this, there's this unhealthy um, uh, bond that develops between the two. And uh, definitely something you want to watch out for. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Are they respecting of you sexually? If, for instance... You don't want to have premarital sex, and this person is pushing you hard to have premarital sex. That's something that's gonna you're definitely gonna want to watch out for because if people don't respect your boundaries outside of marriage, in marriage they they're not gonna care about you. It's gonna be about the next high. It's gonna be about their next um their next adventure, their next uh con what what else can they conquer? It's not really gonna be about you, and that's one of the issues with premarital sex is especially for guys it becomes a conquest, you know um. It's about it's about more of dominating, you know. How can I get into this girl's pants? Not you know, uh, treating this woman like she is worthy of respect. And obviously, you know, a lot of this is not helped by the fact that our, that our culture is very pornography oriented, very um, rape um, centered, and obviously that's not helping. But still, you want somebody who's going to respect you, um, and sexuality is, is a great way to show that. If somebody's willing to hold off the strongest of physical urges for you, chances are they have a higher respect of you. If they're not willing to do that, chances are they are a slave to their own desires, which means that they probably look at pornography or overeat or don't take care of their bodies or – you know what I mean? Because that, that all falls in the same kind of thing, and that's what we're talking about, lust, where you have an uncontrolled um, – we're going to actually look at definitions next week, but um, lust in a simple definition is the uncontrolled desire for more. You know, It's always – it's never fulfilled, and so lust isn't just about sex. It's about life in general. Uh, in fact, a lot of people have pornography problems or sex problems because they have a deeper problem, and we're going to talk about this next week too, um, that's not addressed. Do they love God more than you? Gracie kind of brought this one up. Um, you, you want someone who's not playing church. You want someone who's actually interested in God. But with that being said, obviously, if you're someone who plays church, <laughs> and then you, you, know, you can't expect uh, a knight in shining armor if... <laughs> You're not a maiden, so just throwing that out there. So, anyways, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I wrote this down as just as a side note. Marriage is what can I sacrifice for them, not what can I profit. I, I saw an interesting thing on the internet. It had it had a picture of a sandbox, and it said, "Marriage is like a sandbox. Um, y you get married and." You think that there's something in there, but there's nothing in the mirror, in, in that sandbox. Each person has to put sand into that sandbox for there to be sandbox to, to take out. So what people do is they get married because they have their own passions that they want. I want kids, for instance, and hey, you you look like you'll do. And so we get married for these reasons that aren't for their best interest, but for our best interest. And then we try to take from the sandbox when there's nothing in the sandbox. And so because of this, we get an overdrawn account. What happens when that happens? Is you know the the divide starts happening between the, between the spouse and this is the worsened if there's any history of pornography or, or sex before marriage it makes it worse it's still you can still save the marriage okay but it just makes it harder um, and so then you, you you try to draw from it and, and all of a sudden you wake up one day and you realize that, that your whole marriage is based off of what you want see this is especially hard for me because I grew up w with the mentality that you know, men were the uh, kind of the uh, not just the, the the head of the household. They were the you know what they said was law, and the woman just had to deal with it. So then, coming from that and getting married and realizing that this is not a thing; it's a person. And they has their, uh, Gracie has her own thoughts and her own her own feelings. It completely changes um, how you've grown up your whole life believing. It's just weirdest thing when you start to realize that that there's something attached to that woman besides just a body. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so should I get married? Oh boy. Okay. So Paul actually talks the great in great lengths about this. And did you know not everybody should be married? I know Melissa would shoot me if he was here tonight. Uh, Melissa's Chuck's mom, and she's been trying to get Chuck and Ben to get out there for a while. <laughs> but how old are you? Twenty-eight. Uh, Twenty-eight years. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Anyways. 
Um, and I'm not going to read the whole the whole chapter just because it's a little bit long, but I'll read parts of it. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. He elaborates on this. Um, he elaborates on this a little bit later. See, if you're not married, your desires aren't divided. You can focus more on God's kingdom, and it's okay. Um, if God calls you to move somewhere, it's not that big of an issue. When you're married and God calls you to move, it suddenly is a big issue. You got to pack up the kids. The kid stuff, the wife, the wife stuff. You you gotta do all this all this nonsense. It's it's way harder. Not only that, but God won't call you to the same ministries if you're married as if you're single. That's just a fact of life. Um, God will call you to ministries according um, to your current abilities and your current um, uh, lifestyle choices, your your relationships, these kinds of things. Um, kind of decide how and where God uses us. Um, so obviously, there's a whole different thing that goes on there. But his point here is that. People, by their nature, are not real good at resisting sexual urges. So because of this, there's marriage. <laughs> Basically, is what he's saying here. But because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each wife should, woman should have her own husband. Because it's not realistic to expect that everybody's just going to be able to keep their pants up, you should get married. And, you know, that's definitely, that's definitely a thing. Some people try to go celibate when... They were definitely not the kind of person who's made for that. Um, if you don't know, celibate means uh, to stay single, um, to not have relations with other people. Um, so, um, so don't be on a quest to find a partner. Here in um, in in verse 24, it says, "So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God." Okay. And then in verse 25 it picks up. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. What the idea is, especially in, in, the, in today's church, there's this idea that you have to get married. There's like this rush to it. You know, you have to get married by a certain date so you can have kids by a certain date. And it's like, whoa, hold on. Not everybody's called to be married. And uh, I think that's the biggest problem with, with current standards in, in, in the Christian movement is that you know, we're not supposed to be on a quest to find a partner. If God brings us a partner, that's a good thing. But we shouldn't be setting out on a mission to find a spouse. See what I mean? Uh, because if that's our goal, then well, then that's our goal. See what I mean? But if, if our goal is, is rather... Um, to grow as a Christian, to pour into other people's lives, to serve God, we're going to be a lot more level-headed to pick a spouse. See what I mean? Um, and then, you know, I'll leave that alone. Um, also, another idea that, that people kind of mistakenly believe is that there's, there's this idea, especially in the world, that there's a one person out there. And, you know, are they the one? And, and, and all these different... Do what? Yeah, your soulmate, basically. Yeah, and, and it's funny that this is even a Christian idea. This is something that came from other religions and stuff, and I just think that's, <laughs> that's kind of funny. That so many different things have been adopted into Christianity. Um, but the only part that even talks about, um, you know, strongly about that is in Genesis, uh, um, Abraham's servant is going to find his son a wife, and he says, you know, wh which one, you know, God, you're gonna have to help me out here. And so he brings by the by the wife. And so from that one story, people people draw these conclusions that everybody has a one out there that if they just look hard enough, they're gonna find. It's like <laughs> that's not really what Scripture is saying. I mean, that completely overlooks the the point of the passage to teach something that's not trying to teach. So um, there are there will always be better and worse options out there. And, and part of choosing a spouse is is the maturity. To, to think ahead and, and and to pick it because what what is Song of Solomon teaches you guys remember sometimes when we pick out partners we we're just overcome with the emotions of, of love and and, and and we don't really think that clearly Proverbs talks about you know it's better to live on the corner of a wife than with a content on the corner of, of, a, of a roof than with a contentious wife it's better to you know all these different things and then we read Song of Solomon, and it's like, wow, he didn't really think that far ahead at all. He just was completely enamored with this woman, and she was completely enamored with him, and they just fell head over hills in love, and they just they just made it work, you know. And so there's always that that two sides of it. Um, obviously, you should you should marry someone who you, who you love and who you have feelings for, but at the end of the day, you also have to realize that after those feelings are gone, that person is still a person, and 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 then they still have their own dreams, they still have their own personality. And you have to ask yourself, am I willing to put up with that nonsense after I don't feel anything for them? Because there are definitely times in marriage. I don't want marriage to sound like this this rainbow. 
there are times in marriage when when you do not like your partner. I mean, there's just times when you, you really do not like them. And uh, so this is something you genuinely have to ask. Are you willing to put up with their crap? That's something you have to ask yourself. Are, are you willing? Um, if you are having sex and you want to continue the relationship, you should marry. Um, this is this is what Paul talks about here in, in this in this pa in this uh, chapter here. You can go read it for yourself. He talks about this. Um, obviously, um, you have the option to just to stop having sex. There is that option. But if you want to continue the relationship, it is immoral for it to be continued outside of the bonds of marriage. Um, and so, obviously, God desires uh, marriage in that kind of a situation. Um, some things to consider: finances. Um, love is love, but love doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> I mean, you know, we could live out of a car. Yeah, you could live out of a car, but I mean, that's something that are you willing to live out of a car? Because I'm not saying if, if somebody has these things that you shouldn't marry them. I'm saying you should weigh it and realize they are who they are. Do you still want to marry them? If the person you're choosing for a spouse is, you know, poor or lazy or that kind of a thing, chances are they're going to be like that for the rest of your life. Are you okay with that? So, I mean, seriously, ask yourself these questions because marriage isn't something lighthearted. This is something serious. Um, fading attraction. Are you attracted to them and that's why you want to marry them? Because remember, looks go away. People age. Not only that, but the majority of your life you'll spend ugly. Think about that, okay? You get attracted somewhere in your later teens, right? And then you start losing it somewhere in your 30s or 40s somewhere, depending on who you are. Some people keep it into their 50s, but usually we lose our looks in about the 40s. You know, um, wrinkles start hitting in, gray hair start coming in, and we start seeing ourselves as less, less attractive, right? Am I, am I saying anything we don't agree on? And so you really only have like a 30-year prima of what's considered, you know, drop-dead, gorgeous, Victoria's Secret model. And uh, then after that, you're just a normal person. Before that, you're just a normal person. But because our culture is so obsessed with sex, all of a sudden the looks are the only thing that people care about. See what I mean? And you can't, you can't be happy with yourself unless you're drop-dead gorgeous. You can't be happy with yourself. You have to wear makeup. You have to be attractive. You have to be skinny. You have to do these things. All these things you have to do if you want to be attractive. And, and the truth is that's not biblical. That's something that our culture is telling us. That's not something that our God tells us. Our God tells us that he made us just as we are and that he loves us just as we are. In fact, Paul talks in, in – oh, I want to say it's 1 Corinthians, but don't quote me on that – how these women are doing these different things to get noticed in, in the service. They're wearing their hair a certain way and everything just so that guys will turn their heads at them. And he, he, he writes them and says, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. Your focus should be on God. 1 Timothy. I think it's in 1 Timothy is where that is. Yeah, I think it was in 1 Timothy. Anyways. Um, uh, genetics. Uh, I know I was talking to Chuck. It was you, right? So I was talking to somebody, and they said, you know, this person has a lot of mental, con not mental, uh, physical con physical problems, and the, the person that they're picking it has a lot of physical problems, and they're wanting to produce offspring. And, and you know, he, he raised a good point. That's something you need, need, to, need, to, weigh, need to weigh. If, if something like, okay, here's a perfect example. If dementia runs in your spouse's family, be willing – that if dementia hits them, to stick with them through it. So you may be willing for that. And if it doesn't, be willing that it might go into your kids. And just be knowledgeable about this. It's okay. I'm not saying – I'm just saying don't abandon your spouse because they weren't physically perfect. See what I mean? Know who your spouse is and then accept them for it and stick with them through it. You know what I mean? I know if I start going and going dementia, I don't want Gracie to bail out on me. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't like that. Alzheimer's, no man. Um, if, if there's a there's a story of I think it was a grandpa or an uncle, I forget who. But anyways, he wakes up next to his wife and he looks over and he says, "Oh my gosh, who are you? There's this old lady in my bed with me. Where's my wife?" And it was his wife, but you know they were in their 70s now, and he didn't recognize her because he had Alzheimer's, and he was expecting to turn over and see this young 20-year-old thing, and it was not a young 20-year-old thing. <laughs> so, you know, be 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 willing to deal with these kinds of things. Um, um, yeah, I remember I was talking to you about it, and uh, they just had a lot of health health things, and uh, for that situation, I would have highly encouraged them to adopt rather than have natural kids, just because they had so many um, men, uh, physical conditions. And the thing about it was they were both carriers, and not carriers. Um, the, the gene was, um, what is it called? Not recessive. Dominant. Dominant. It was dominant in both of them. And so the chances are that 
none of their kids would have had it as recessive. The chances are that it, it would have been dominant in, in their kids. And so, I mean, that's something you have to be aware of. I know one guy who had this thing running for, through, running through his family. He went ahead and took the chance with his kid and with his wife, and they had a kid, and uh, the, the kid died before it even reached a year old. And, I mean, that's a really sad story, but we have to we have to realize that, that our physical health, and nobody's perfect physically, but some things you know, are going to definitely affect your life, and you have to... You have to be willing to deal with it, I guess is what I'm saying. Family cohesion. I already kind of talked about this. Is it something that's going to divide your family? And if so, are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to pay that price? Because this is basically what people try to do. They try to get married, and then they still try to keep their parents between their spouse. You understand what I'm saying? Where, like, at the end of the day, they're making decisions based off of what their parents say, not what their spouse says. At the end of the day, they're getting in arguments against their spouse with their parents. And they're ganging up against their spouse. Do you from, know what I mean? From the examples I've seen, and I could be wrong, but I've seen that women tend to do that a lot more. Like, oh, especially a mom to yeah. a mom. I've noticed it happens more when that happens. A mom to a mom. I mean, a daughter to a mom. Yeah. Um, however, it, it does happen with everybody, but yeah. I, I do think that out of the situations that we see, it's usually the, usually the woman. Not that men don't have their own stupid things. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Men do their own stupid things. Um, but that's something you're definitely going to want to think about. Um, how do they treat you around their family? How do they act around your family? Um you know, just different things to think about like that. Um, obviously, I already talked about hidden traits. You, you want to stick with them long enough before you marry that you actually know who the person is. That's, I mean, something that I wish high schoolers understood. Um, so there's nothing wrong with marriage, but there's nothing wrong with being single either. We're going to talk about next week's celibacy. And uh, Jesus actually talked about celibacy. And one of the things he said about it was, not everyone is called to it. And I think that that's a very important thing. We'll look at that next week, but... I want you guys to think about that. Not everyone is called to, called to stay single, um, and not everyone is called to go called to be married. Um, but I will say that sometimes we, we make things harder for ourselves. Like uh, maybe we have a very hard time with our sexuality, um, in the and specifically in like the uh, the sex area, you know, orgasms and that kind of stuff. And so we kind of um, try to treat ourselves as a monster. Like, oh, this isn't natural. And the truth is, no, our sexuality is natural. Orgasms, those things are natural. Sex is natural. I mean, it's a, the animals are doing it, people are doing it. It's it's a natural process. It's something that God made. It's a beautiful thing, but God made it to be in marriage. So I mean, there is that, uh, obviously. Um, and so we have to be honest with ourselves. Do you really want to be single? Because if you want to be single, that means no sexual no sexual activity. And we're going to talk about masturbation next week. So don't don't hang me yet. Is it okay to masturbate? We'll talk about that next week. Um, in marriage and out of marriage. We'll talk about them both. Um, yeah. But uh, then there's other people who, who I don't even know why they get married. They, they want to go off and do their own thing all the time. They're completely okay with never having sex. It's like, man, oh, man, why did you just stay single? Um, but anyways, that was a joke. I wasn't being serious just then. <laughs> um, so marriage doesn't have to become boring. I know media makes it out to be marriage is this, that's how you kill your sexuality. As soon as you marry, sex stops being enjoyable. It's it's just a terrible thing. And the truth is, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Um, if, if you and your spouse both work hard, you can make marriage, you know, uh, rejuvenated. You can make it living. You can make it joyous. It doesn't have to become dull and boring. Um, obviously, if you do the same repetitive task over and over every single day, Okay, it's six o'clock on Wednesday. This is the time that we have sex. You know, well, well then it's going to become a little dull. You know, um, but it doesn't have to be like that. You can still do things like write poems for your spouse or buy your buy your spouse spouse special things. Uh, help them out with little jobs that they've been that they have to do, or or maybe do a job for them. Like, uh, your, let's say your wife is going to do the laundry. Uh, you know, do the laundry for. Her, you know what I mean? Um, and you can do little things like that. That that that. The feelings of spiciness may go away, and they may not come back, or they may come back in spurts. But love is much more than feelings. Feelings are more like the precursor that love is on the way. Feelings are like, if you stay your course, you can love this person. 
that's a good a good example of what feelings are. But love is, is is a dedication to somebody. Love is love is seeing the pig that your spouse can be and forgiving them for it, <laughs> and just being okay with that. You know what I mean? That's love. It, it, it's it's go when I was almost dead in the hospital. Gracie took off of work uh, to go be with me in the hospital, and then she had to work overtime to make up for the hours that she lost. You know, stuff like that. It's not about it's not about these feelings that, that may or may not be there. And in our culture, that's all it's emphasized is if the feelings aren't there, it's not love. I've fallen out of love with this person. You can't fall out of love with somebody because it's a choice that you make with that person. Um, the Bible is abundantly clear on this, you know. Um, and obviously you can revive th those feelings, but regardless of whether the feelings are there or not, you have to be okay with the fact that that's not all that love is. So... Um, Two people can renew it daily. Stop looking, and it's easier to not compare. Oh boy, if you <laughs> if you are in a relationship of any kind, stop looking. <laughs> you're you are off the market. Your partner, whether it's a and you're dating or you're married, whatever, is off the market too. Stop looking. <laughs> you're just gonna make it harder on yourself, and then you're gonna start comparing yourself and uh, and your partner to this other person. That's one of the really disastrous things for pornography in marriage. As you start looking, oh, that's what sex is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be this wild, crazy thing, and then you start judging your spouse because they're not measuring up to this this porn star. And you know, and it's, it's, that's not real life. It's it's fantasy. It's make believe. You know, and uh, so stop looking. And it's easier to not compare. I mean, that's I, I know it sounds real simple, but it's that simple. It is that simple. Just just I, I sometimes I have to do this if I'm walking in the mall and there's a lot of you know attractive girls or anything. I'll take off my glasses because I can barely see anything without my glasses. Just take off my glasses. I can't see anything. I just take Grace's hand, and she'll lead me off, and I don't know what the heck, where the heck I'm going. <laughs> well, now I know not everybody here has that has that great benefit of poor vision, but you know you can still do some things. Um, you know, uh, different people have different triggers that they really set them off sexually, and different people have different ways of coping with them. But uh, just find something that works for you. Um, here's another solution. Um, if you just stare, if you're out in public and you just stare at your wife's face or her husband's face, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's awkward. Yeah, it's awkward. Oh boy, it's awkward. But I'll tell you what, your eyes won't be on anything else. So hey, whatever. <laughs> at the end of the day, that you can still say it's a victory, right? Um, <laughs> oh boy. So everyone is tempted. And that's just something that we have to deal with. Just because you're married doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted to be attracted. I mean, sorry, doesn't mean you're not going to be attracted to another person. That is, I don't know where that came from, but absolutely no. Absolutely no. Uh, marriage, in fact, oftentimes will make you more attracted to somebody that's not, not attractive. Okay? Why? Because you look at the same person every day and you deal with the bullcrap every day. And, it, and sometimes you get irritated at them. And so if something else starts to look a whole lot better. It's the green hill the idea, you know. Uh, the grass is greener over there. If I could just go over there. And it, it never works, but I mean, it's that mentality that we get. Um, man, oh man. Uh, I was thinking about the chili rianos last night. I was going to use it as an example, but I couldn't. Gracie made homemade chili rianos um, last night. And I was going to say that, you know, it's like eating a chili rian. You're like, oh, maybe the next one will be better. But they were all so good. And then I had another one, and it was better than the last one. And oh, my gosh. <laughs> Whew, so bad example. I'm not going to use that one as an example. Uh, anyways, but so everyone is tempted. Do not think that you are less of a person or less spiritual or less of a Christian because you are tempted. Everyone is tempted. If you're single, you will be tempted. If you are married, you will be tempted. The problem is, how do you deal with that temptation? That is the issue. Okay, To expect of yourself or your partner to never be tempted is not fair. That's not fair. What did I just say? We are sexual beings. Okay, We will always notice that there's an attractive person out there. That's just what will happen. Even if you never go outside of the house, if you watch TV, it will happen. If you never do anything but play video games, you'll start being attracted to the video game girls. I'm telling you, you're going to find it. Wherever, no matter what you do, it's going to happen. And what's important is that we learn how to, how to, how to interact with, with that monster inside of us. How to, how, to, how to realize that we are sexual but not give in to those, into that sexuality. And that's the line between lust and biblical sexuality. Lust gives itself away no matter what. If it fills, it takes. If you're hungry, eat more. If you're starved, eat more. I mean, if you're if you're stuffed, eat more. If you've had sex, have more sex. If you had one girl, have five girls. It's this idea of always getting more, never being content with the, with the with the, with what where you at. So, anyways, but you can fight it. 
or you can accept it. And at the end of the day, you have to you have to live with the with the actions that you've decided to uh, to take. So, anyways, in, in the book, um, I told you guys how we were using this book as as part of the part of this course, um, the Challenge of the Disciplined Life by Richard Foster. He talks about he quotes this one guy who compares it to to a uh, compares it like this. There's a bunch of people who go in and sit at a table with a meal. And all of the things on the table, all the food things are sitting there, but they're all covered. And so w they, they put on music and they slowly start taking off the lid. And right as you start to glimpse what's in it, they close it back and turn off the lights. Wouldn't you say that that's not a normal behavior to eat? Right? But yet, isn't that exactly what happens with strip teas? With, you know, strip bars and stuff? I mean, the exact same thing. It's, it's not a natural form of sexuality. It's something that has definitely been corrupted. So, <clears throat> what do you do if you're married or dating and you have, I mean, you just fall head over heels in love with somebody? And this is something that Gracie and I have have personally uh, dealt, with some, dealt with some things and with some people on. Gracie knows what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and, and this is something, I mean, really, it's something that I think has brought Gracie and I closer together through the process of it. Uh, because we're able to talk about it and we're able to be real with each other, you know what I mean? And, and that's just something that, 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 that can go either way. So w when, when you're in a relationship with somebody and you're overcome with strong emotions for a person, what do you do? Well, there's a few things. First off, try um, avoidance ta tactics. Don't go near the person. Don't look at the person. If you have them on Facebook, defriend them. I mean, um, what we had to do is we had there was a whole place in Alamogordo that we had to just completely stop going to. And uh, and I was real with Gracie. I said, you know, I, I'm really being tempted with this. Um, I find this person so extremely attractive. Uh, you know, I, I, I it was to the point where I was acting silly around them. You know what I mean? And uh, it was not healthy because I'm married. So I mean, attraction is a normal thing, but when you're married, you take a vow to not to not do that. And so I talked to Grace and I said, "Look, I'm sorry that I'm feeling this way, but I am feeling this way." So we stopped going to that place in Alamogordo. We just we just even to this day we don't go by go don't go by it because if you've had a problem in the past with something, you know, don't tempt yourself. You know, pornography. I try not to stay home if home alone if since we have internet at the house. Because I was in pornography before. I got into it when I was nine. I didn't get out of it until I was 23. That's a heck of a long time to be in pornography. <laughs> I think maybe I shouldn't tempt myself. You know what I mean? And especially if you've already done something, it's easier to do it again the second time. So, okay, uh, try avoidance te techniques. That really helps well. Um, also, um, take that sexual energy and instead point it towards your spouse. Do you know what I mean? Um, take it and instead of thinking about that person... Think about your spouse and, and what they do for you and, and how attractive they are or, or some of the things that really attracted you to them uh, when you first got married. I mean, or even have more sex with your spouse. I, I know people kind of like, what? But yeah, uh, oftentimes if we're not having a sex with our spouses frequently, these kinds of things can happen. And, and really, you'd be surprised how many people come to, come to us pastors and say this, you know, uh, I, I've had an affair, or I, I'm on pornography, or, or I'm having a really hard time with this. And I mean, everybody's going through it. And you know, the thing is, is every single person always feels so ashamed. You know, like they're the only person who's ever done it. And it's like, we all fall. <laughs> you know what I mean? We all mess up. So you messed up in the past. It's, it's really bad, that, you know, a terrible thing. But your marriage can recover from this. It can. It's hard, you know, and there will be scars, but it can recover. So... Um, never, ever, ever give up on somebody who's, who's cheated. Uh, I know one person was having a hard time because their brother had done something. And, you know, never give up on somebody. And, 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 and never, if it's your spouse especially, you know, never, never give up on somebody. Because nobody's too far gone. And, and remember that, that people can't stop. I was in porn for a long time and I got out of it. Do you know what I mean? You can, you can get out of stuff like that. You can as long as you're both willing to, you can. Anyways, um, so starve the feelings. Do whatever you can to starve the feelings. Um, don't talk to the person. Don't look at the person. Don't call the person. Never, ever, ever be around the person, especially alone. If it's a situation like work, because I get asked that one a lot. It's someone I work with. Well, I, that really does suck um, because there's not a whole lot you can do. Try to not be alone with the person. Okay, just an idea. Um, 
if it's really intense and um, and you've already had an affair, I would recommend getting a different job. And I know for some people that sounds pretty extreme, but your marriage is more important than your financial well-being. And that's just kind of how it is. And you have to make that decision. It's a hard decision. But at the end of the day, that's just how it is. Um, you are not destined to fail. Uh, I was, we were talking to one person who, who uh, came out of homosexuality, and, and uh, they were okay, but then you know they had a they had a relapse, and they started you know um, giving blowjobs to you know same sex kind of stuff again. And uh, one of the things that they said is, "This is just who I am. I understand that, that you know you have temptations, but here's the thing: we are not destined to fail." We are never destined to fail. And just because we have failed in the past doesn't mean that we will fail in the past. I mean in the future. We just have to realize that, that you know the past is the past. Learn from it, but move on. Learn from it, but move on. And uh, so you're not destined to fail. So then that takes us to the idea of sadism and masochism. If you remember last week we were talking about sexism. And sexism is the idea that either of the, the male or the female is dominant to the other one. Okay? So if you're a man, you're inherently better than your wife, or if you're a wife, you're inherently better than the male. And we talked about this. Male and women are different. Man and woman, they're, they're, they're two, different, two, different, two different things. They have different desires, different drives, and that's okay. That's normal. That, that, that's not something that we should try to – we shouldn't try to make our spouse like us. You know what I mean? Um, that we should instead celebrate the diversity, and, and, and I think that sexism fails to do that. It fails to understand that it's a real person. So if you're at all familiar with sadism and masochism, it's basically the idea of uh, bondage and that kind of stuff. Um, it, it's strongly rooted in um, sexual pleasure through um, pain, through um, dominance, uh, through um, mistreating people. Uh, it's like um, a rape that you're accepting. I mean, I, that's kind of a dumb definition, but I think it works. Um, and if you're at all familiar with, with media, a movie actually came out, I think it was last year or the year before, called uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. And this basically is the idea of the movie, is, is it's a, a, an S&M relationship between these two people. Um, and, and I think there's three books in this series, Fifty Shades of Grey, Darker Grey, or I forget, you know, I, I'm not even going to try to remember what they're called. But anyways, um, and that's just kind of the idea of sadism and masochism. And so the first problem with this, and remember, sex and marriage is a good thing. It's not just for procreation. It's for pleasure, for relaxa relaxation, for a lot of different things. Um, so there, there's nothing wrong with you know doing other positions besides the missionary position, for instance. There's, there's nothing wrong with that kind of stuff. Okay, but I personally feel like sadism and masochism kind of is unbiblical because it sex is supposed to be caring and loving. It's supposed to be real intimacy between two people. And I feel like with sadism and masochism, it kind of puts a rift between that. And instead of that, you have pain, not relationship. You know what I mean? And I'm just not sure if this is a very healthy thing to allow in your in your in your relationship. I, I feel like personally, I personally feel like it's something that if it continues in the bedroom, will eventually cause a rift between you and your spouse spiritually. That's my opinion, though, and uh, you're open to your own opinions. You know, I'm not trying to make you. This is not from Bi the Bible. This is for me. Um, but it can become a substitute for a relationship. Um, if you're at all familiar with things like you know watching mass or watching pornography while having sex with your spouse, those kinds of things, um, there's this idea that um, you're not really spending any time, any face time with your spouse. You know what I mean? You're not really spending any time paying attention to them. And I feel like S&M does that to a greater degree than even pornography does. Um, but anyways, um, and, and these there's some very things that go around it. It's about rape. It's about domination. It's about humiliating the other person. It's about destroying the other person and gaining sexual pleasure from that. And and I don't want to over-condemn them. You know, obviously, if this is something you enjoy, I'm not trying to say, hey, this is above and beyond anything. But it seems to me like these things have kind of a demonic origin. It's not about building each other up. It's not about love. It's not about, you know, that. It's about just this this twisted worldly idea of, of you know, um, making the other person less. And I don't know if that's um, really a good idea to do. Um, but anyways, um, yeah. So, kind of the sex equivalent of sexism.
Any questions on anything we talked about? No. Okay. Well, last week we started talking about a few things, so I just want to kind of uh, look at that a little bit more. Okay, so looking at pornography is wrong. Okay, all right, I can deal with that. Well, what about looking at cartoon por pornography? Because it's not a real person, right? So that's like a loophole in the system. And we'll talk more about this next when we talk about masturbation, um, whether or not masturbation in and of itself is a good or bad thing, um, and if it's a good thing in marriage or if it's a good thing being single, all these different things. Um, and I think you're, I think you're going to be surprised about what the Bible does and doesn't say about masturbation. So if you're at all curious, I uh, recommend you um, checking that out. But anyways, the idea behind pornography is about <coughs> that there's such a thing – as a simple orgasm without bondage. And I think that's a very naive idea. Um, and so I think that cartoon porn in and of itself is not bad. It can be a very creative way to release built up tension sexually. Um, but there are a few uh, qualifiers to this. First off, if there's an attitude of lust that you're not checking it's going to be something where it causes you to be in a worse place sexually rather than a better place sexually. And we talked about this last week. There is no physical condition that blue balls is going to cause. Okay, You are not going to become ill in any way by not having sex. Um, yeah. So uh, – so there's a kind of that idea, attitude of, of less that kind of goes on. So you might want to definitely watch, and, you, and obviously if you're someone who's masturbating frequently, yeah, that's probably something you need to get some help on. And we'll talk more about that next week, but there is that. Um, also, there's the idea that lust always escalates. Um, I've talked to many people who, who say something like this. Oh, well, I looked at cartoon porn. Well, yeah, but you never, ever, ever in that time you're looking at cartoon porn ever stop and look at actual porn, like with real people. Well, yeah, sometimes I, I can't find the cartoon, and I, so I just go to a movie. It's like, <laughs> so I mean, so I didn't resolve the issue at all. Well, no. Well, also there's the thing that a lot of cartoons are based off of people, um, and so you're just masturbating to a cartoon version of a real person. So I, I'm curious as to whether that really resolves the issue. Um, and, the, and the attitude behind it still has this whole idea about, about less is okay. And so I would definitely do a caution about this. I'm not going to say watching cartoon porn is, you know, going to send you to hell, but I'm going to say you definitely want to watch out uh, for stuff like that. Justifying stuff is never a good idea. Um, but porn in and of itself is cheating on your spouse. I want to clarify that in case I didn't make that clear last um, last week or the week before. Um, if you are looking at pornography, you are cheating on your spouse. It does not matter if you are actually touching the person or not. If, if it is happening in your mind, it is happening. Jesus made this abundantly clear. He said, you know, um, in Matthew, um, oh, crap, that's going to bother me. Uh, I want to say it's somewhere around chapter 7, but I'm not positive about that. Oh, that's going to bug me. Well, anyways, uh, in Matthew, he talks about uh, how um, if it's happened up here, it's happened. Uh, so, was Jesus gay with the disciple he loved? We, we were talking about was Jesus married, and this was a question that was brought up afterwards. You know, equally popular is the idea, well, was Jesus gay? Um First off, this is kind of imposing a modern understanding um, to the situation. Um, just because John calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved doesn't mean that he made love to him. This is a modern understanding of an ancient text. So there's that. Second off, um, he would have been rejected as the Christ both in the Jewish circles and the Gentile circles. I mean, that just wouldn't have gone over very well. And as we talked about, the New Testament was written when Jesus was still when the people who knew Jesus was were still alive. I think they would have known that and not been okay with that. Um, also, it, 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 uh, Jesus always affirmed marriage as a man and a woman. Uh, he always you know, affirmed, affirmed those kinds of things. He didn't clarify on anything that the Old Testament said regarding sexuality. Um, so it's a bit of a leap to then say, you know, ignore all that evidence and say, hey, uh, <laughs> Jesus was gay. But then also there's no historical or literary basis for this claim, so there's just something like that. I mean, it's that simple. So we're going to talk about homosexuality here, in, homosexuality here in a minute, but before we do, I want to talk about transsexual specifically. Okay? Transsexual is basically – and I, I know I'm oversimplifying this. I really am sorry. 
a man trapped in a woman's body, a woman trapped in a man's body. Okay, so what's the biblical answer to this? Well, it's a lot simpler than the world is making it. First off, believing yourself to be something that you are not, that's a mental disorder. Okay, I, I know people are getting confused about this. If I believe myself to be a tree, I'm still a man. That make sense? And believing myself to be a tree is not going to change the fact of what I am. In the same way, we are man and woman according to our chromosome. That's scientific. I know people ask, well, what about what our DNA shows? Our DNA doesn't show anything about a man trapped in a woman's body. <laughs> it doesn't show anything like that. Um, however, I will say this. Sometimes people think that they're a woman trapped in a man's body because they're hobbies. Maybe they like sewing or doing things that are traditionally women. Um, that doesn't make you a female, nor does uh, liking trucks make you make a woman a man. I mean, that's just uh, having having hobbies that are deemed male or female doesn't make you a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body. Um, also, uh, a lot of times with transsexuality, it's more of, of a mental confusion that is somebody actually needs help on. So, really, the best tactic is to make sure that they get help because. Sometimes, you know, they can actually have genuine problems, um, you know, split personality and that kind of stuff. Um, and so you obviously want to make sure that, that you're there for them, that you're um, encouraging them, always pointing forward to Christ. But, but we need to be honest about this. This is a mental disorder. This is not something that I know people, people, oh, you can't call it a mental disorder. If they want to love that, then they can. Okay, let's take that same logic. So it's okay for me to have sex out of marriage. Um, with this nine-year-old, because hey, I was attracted to the nine-year-old. What? So I mean, like, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't matter. There's morality and there's not morality. If you decide morality, then that's not really morality. That's that's bias. So I mean, so with that being said, just because you believe something or greatly desire something does not make it so. Okay. I'm not saying that they are not confused. I'm not saying that they that they are not attracted. But you know, whatever. What's really confusing is when you have a man have surgery to be a woman, and you have a woman have surgery to be a man, and they get together. That's even more confusing because, I don't know, anyway, why not just save yourself the surgery costs and all that pain and just marry as man and woman and you can just say, hey, I'm going to be the woman, Grace, and you'll be the man, okay? <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so attraction doesn't make you, once again, we talk, we're going to talk about this homosexuality. Attraction to the same sex doesn't make you that. We'll just, hold on, we'll get to that, hold on. Um, wishing for something that isn't doesn't make it so. I wish that we had another option besides Trump and Clinton, but we didn't. I'm sorry, we didn't. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, wishing that something is doesn't change what actually was. Um, so be just because a man wishes that he was a woman, this is not adequate reason to get surgery to make yourself a woman. I would also like to like to em emphasize a few things. When... When a sex change procedure is done, it's not how it sounds. First off, like if a woman has her part turned into a penis, for instance, a lot of the feeling is dead, and it doesn't really work at all. Um, and when a man has his penis turned into you know, a vagina, you're not actually going to be able to produce offspring. And you're not going to have periods. You're not going to have it, – it's, it's just going to look like one on the outside. See what I mean? So it doesn't actually change it. Okay, your chromosome count is still the same. It does not change that. So then people ask, well, what about the people who have um, both man and woman parts? Actually, that's largely blown out of context. Usually, both parts will not be fully developed. Okay, in which case, what decides? Well, you look at the chromosomes and you see if it's a man or a woman, and then you do the surgery accordingly. Or you can keep both parts if you wanted to, whatever. But like I said, there's, there's, I know people talk about she males and stuff. It's not like you're gonna walk up and see a woman with a fully developed penis and a fully developed vagina. It's not gonna happen. Um, and with that being said, the percentage of people who actually do have both parts, to whatever degree, are a relatively small part of the population. So I mean, I, I think that sometimes it's blown out of proportion. Like, ah, they're everywhere. No, they're they're, they're really not. It, it, it's 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 a it's a mutation of the human body. It's not actually. Uh, see what I mean? And with that being said, the chromosome count is still going to be that. It's not like there's a third chromosome count that they can have, where it's male and female. It's not like they can mate, mate with themselves and impregnate themselves. It's not going to happen. It doesn't work like that. So, anyways, um, uh, okay, yeah, all right. So let's talk about homosexuality in and of itself. First off, 
Um, I have to say this because, you know, there are churches like the um, Westboro Baptist. Uh, yeah, that's what it's called, Westboro Baptist. I, I always call it one that's called Hillsboro. It's not Hillsboro. It's Westboro. Westboro, Westboro Baptist, uh, where, you know, where they go and picket people and, and all these different nonsense. And, and uh, I just want to throw this out. This homophobia is not okay as a Christian. We don't need to be scared of, of homosexuals. It's not going to jump off them and catch on to us. It's not like we're going to be homosexual because we spend time with homosexuals. Okay, just throw that out there. Uh, next off, we don't have to mistreat homosexuals. Homosexuality is another sin, not the greatest of all sins. Okay, let's keep things in perspective here. Third off, if you really want to want to witness to a homosexual, the best way to do it is to treat them like a human being and not like a virus. Just on that there. If you actually want to reach people with the love of Christ, treat them like a person. See what I mean? Um, it's a bad thing when the culture is treating people who are misplaced better than Christians are. Christians are supposed to be known by their love. Okay. Sometimes people are going to do things that annoy us or that we don't agree with. You know, we don't have to condone it, but we don't have to. We don't have to pick at them. Okay. There are other options. You can love somebody unconditionally without liking everything that they do. Okay. I don't like the way Chuck's in a wheelchair. If he had enough faith, he could get out. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, the funny story I'll tell you about some other time. Um, <laughs> actually, I think I already have. But anyways, uh, you know, people are just not gonna not gonna do everything that you like, and their opinions are gonna differ from your own, and, and you have to be okay with that. Especially nowadays, guys, because people are telling telling us everywhere it's okay to get offended about everything, everything, and I do mean everything. And so everybody's getting offended at everything. I mean, literally everything. The 2016 sucked. We had clowns scaring people. We had uh, what are some other things? Uh, the Black Lives Matter started uh, well, the election. pretty much this year. The whole election, that was a joke. Well, let, let's talk about what you guys are going to do for America. Hillary's a liar. Trump's an idiot. What? I want to know who's going to help America, not who's worse than the other person. Goodness sakes. You know, this year, just people getting offended about everything. You know how many families and friendships I've, I, I saw broken up over the elections? How stupid. They're going to be in office four years. Your family will always be family. Like, what a stupid thing to do. And I'm talking about people getting divorces and stuff because they weren't voting for the same person. Like, how stupid can we think? And, you know, the thing is, is the media is just making it worse. Obama got on the other day. President Obama, sorry, I always address people with respect. President Obama got on the other day, and he hasn't addressed the issue of all these people rioting, not once. And he finally addresses, and you know what he says? Keep it up. Thanks, President Obama, for stirring the pot. Awesome. See, I mean, that's not what people need. People need a leader to, 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 to resolve the issue, not cause it to be worse. Um, but anyways, got a little bit off topic there. <laughs> it's not okay for Christians to be treating people like that. It's not okay. You know, we see Jesus. How is he always treating people? This woman's caught in adultery. Caught in adultery. What, what, what did he say? You know what I mean? Jesus is accused of being, um, it's called a, a bastard child, but I don't know what, what else it's called, um, an Ill illegitimate. Jesus is accused of being an illegitimate child. The Jews say it's something like this. We are not, uh, are not incest children of Abraham. We are purebreds. And Jesus doesn't even defend himself. Not at all. He immediately goes, goes with, you don't really even know what you're talking about with salvation because this is actually what's required with salvation. And they're like, oh, well. See what I mean? We don't have to... This, there's this idea in the church that we have to stick up for God because he can't do it for himself. And we need to make sure that we're picketing things and you know, voting is going to make the biggest difference rather than prayer. Remember when prayer used to actually mean something among the Christian church? Now it's just kind of a out there somewhere. I, see, I saw more Christians trying to yell people out of their political uh, convictions than praying for the elections. That's a, That's not right. That's not okay. We as Christians are held to a standard of loving people, not judging the world. Paul even says it like this. What business do I have judging the world? Rather, yeah, judges in the church. Make sure that things in the church are running like they're supposed to be doing, but if you separate yourself from the world, you'll have to go out of the world. See, and that, that's a whole monk uh, fallacy. So also, Christians should never have the idea of superiority. I'm better than you because I don't struggle with that thing. Oh, you struggle with homosexuality? Oh, I'm better than you because I don't. Um, and in fact, that has been em emphasized in the, in the church in recent years. Divorce is okay. Divorce is okay. It's fine. 
But you have homosexual uh, tendencies? Nope, that's not okay. Well, yeah. divorce and just living with someone. Yeah. Honestly, 20, 30 years ago, you, people were always writing articles and stuff. I still stumble upon the articles from when they wrote 50 years ago, you know, about how, you know, living with people is a sin. And it, But then we just got used to it, and suddenly churches were okay with it. But then homosexuality is legalized, and oh my gosh, let's, let's throw a fit. You know, people were they were already having homosexual, uh, homosexual sex, and we didn't really care. We just kind of avoided them. Why do we suddenly care? Because it's illegal. Because it's legal. So the LGBT community feels out of misunderstood. How could we possibly use this as an advantage to teach them the love of Christ? See what I mean? But instead of seizing the opportunity, just like the Syrian crisis, we're letting it pass by our hands because we're scared of refugees, because we're scared of homosexuals. See what I mean? God is, God is literally laying great golden opportunities before us. All we have to do is reach out and grab them, and people will be saved. Some, some Christians are actually doing this, and the Muslims that are being impacted are being greatly changed. Just droves of them coming to Christ because Christians aren't because some Christians aren't afraid to, aren't afraid to um, to do what's right regardless of how they feel about the situation. And you know what the media is doing? The media is making it a thing about us against them, whites against blacks, everybody against Muslims, this against that. We don't need to be sucked up in that nonsense, guys. We don't. The same things Christ said two thousand years ago still apply to us now two thousand years later. And that's this. doesn't matter what the government's doing. You are the light of the world. You do not hide your bushel, uh, your light under a bushel. You do not do that. But what we've done is we've become imperialized. If it's good for, the, for America, it's good for the church. Not always, guys. Not always. Um, it is not a sin to be tempted. And a lot of people are confused because they feel homosexual thoughts or, or whatever towards, you know, tw obviously towards the same sex. And it confuses them. That means I'm homosexual. Well, in the same sense that it makes somebody a child molester if they had a passing thought, or in the same way that it makes someone an adulterer if they were tempted to cheat on their wife. See what I mean? What happens up here should not be – I'm, I'm not trying to condone it. But temptation is just that, temptation to do something. Jesus himself was tempted in the wilderness. Does that mean that he was sinful? No, not at all. Temptation is just that. Temptation. Just because you are tempted with homosexual feelings or thoughts does not make you homosexual. What makes you homosexual is giving in to those thoughts. That's what that's that's what makes me a cheater on my wife. If I cheat. Not if I'm tempted to cheat. See what I mean? Do you see what I mean? It's something that we need to be need to stop condemn, condemning people for. And then this is what else we do. So you gave in to your temptations after years of being confused. You finally gave in to your homosexual temptations. Now there is no greater sin. It's like people who, who, who get divorced or, or, or cheat on their spouses. All of a sudden, they're the lowest of the low. You know, And the truth is, God wants to use those situations as a testimony to other people that there is still hope, You know, that, that, that situations can change, that, that God can bring life to death. But instead, we shame people. So I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't condone immorality. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is sometimes Christians get so caught up on condemning everything. What is it that was said that that people don't know what they stand for anymore? You know, there's you know the majority of America's church doesn't know that Jesus is fully God. They think he's a lesser being. The majority, it's like 70 or 80 percent of Christians believe that Jesus is a lesser person. He is fully God, the same as God the Father. But they don't know that. See what I mean? Like, <laughs> anyways, feelings do not dictate what is moral. Whether it's homosexual, child, animal, it doesn't matter what it is. Immorality is going to be immorality, and feelings are not going to dictate that. Holy crap! What do I do? Go back. <laughs> Undo the thing that you're. Okay, there we go. Goodness sakes, guys! So many buttons on these computers. I swear. <laughs> Um, so feelings do not dictate what is what is moral. Just because you have a feeling or, or a desire to do something doesn't mean that it is okay to do that thing. Um, there is the, the you, you hear people going back and forth about this one, so I just want to bring clarity. There is actually no scientific data that says that people are born gay. I'm sorry if you had your mind made up on this. It, there is no hard data. People have theorized, people have, have assumed, but there is no hard data. Um, but with that being said... The Bible says that we are born into sin, so it doesn't really matter. Some of us are going to have struggles with 
with lust. Some of us are going to have struggles with greed. Some of us are going to have struggles with pride. See what I mean? And uh, so the so the Bible fully affirms that we are born into sin. And uh, you know it doesn't matter if someone has gay genes in them or not. That doesn't condone morality. The Bible condones morality. God made the law. That's how it works. Um, sometimes people use this as, as a trump card. Well, I was born gay. Well, uh, A, that's not scientific. Once again, people have, oh, well, this gene shows that. No, not really. That's what it looks like if you don't know anything about biology. That I guess you could say that. But the truth is that, no, it, it doesn't show that. Um, but with that being said, you know that, that, that really is not even a factor. That's like saying, I was born with child molesting genes in me. I was born with genes to rape animals in me. So I have sex with animals because it's in my genes. Like, it's still immoral. See what I mean? It doesn't matter what, what you say is in your genes. or what, it, that's not, It's not even the issue. Morality is the issue. And morality is shown to us by God. So there are different degrees of, of gay, I will say that. Sometimes people are just going through hormonal, hormonal changes. You see teenagers with this a lot. In fact... Did you know that the grand majority of, 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 of teenagers and, and, kid, and, and children, preteen and teen, teens, who have homosexual tendencies grow out of it by the time that they're in, in their uh, mid to early 20s? Just interesting fact there. Um, I believe it's somewhere around the seven – either it's, it's either 70 or it's 90, and I don't remember exactly. But either way, the majority of them grow out of it. So once again, these people are not having that great of a, great of a problem. Um, sometimes when people go through extreme changes in an environment – it can cause them to have uh, confusing sexuality uh, for them. Uh, and these aren't really uh, what I'd call true gays. Um, sometimes people are shown affection from, from the same sex, and they just mistake it because they've never been shown affection like that before. And so they think that they're in love. Do you know what I mean? Or they've been so mistreated and hurted by the opposite, hurt by the opposite sex that they lean into the same sex. And, you know, that's obviously a tragedy too. Um, or sometimes they're just attracted to one person and so they think that it's I'm gay you know so, well it's not really like that but um, because of a fixa fixation on hollow sex in our culture and the media's claims sexuality is very ambiguous and the, and, and the defining factor basically let me break that down people are not sure of sexuality in America because it's been made into this ambiguous thing I mean maybe you're a man maybe you're a woman who knows maybe you're a man trapped in a woman who knows you know, you go, oh, God knows. When the, when the truth is, this is this is scientific, guys. It's not just the Bible. It's not like I'm, I'm depending on, on a book that's thousands of years old. Scientific. You're a man or a woman based on your chromosome count. That That's it. That's simple. I mean, it's not that complicated of an issue. Um, and then as far as who you're attracted to, a lot of things can make you attracted to somebody. And some people genuinely will have homosexual feelings and be Christian till the day that they die. That can happen. Okay? Just like there will be some people who are tempted to be drunk all the time. I'm not saying dreaming is sin, but being, getting drunk is a sin. And there will be people who go to their graves w w struggling with that. There will be people who go to their and go to their graves struggling with drugs or, or, or this, that, or the other thing. And they'll still get to heaven. Do you know why? Because it's not based on our good works. It's based on depending on Christ's works that are already completed. See what I mean? So that being said, once again, we need to put, them, put homosexuality in context. People who are genuinely struggling, struggling with their sexual identity and are genuinely lost... And sometimes are genuinely attracted to the same sex, and it's not something they're going to grow out of. They're going to struggle with it with their whole life. Um, so, true homosexuals cannot will themselves out of it. You can't pray the gay way if somebody's an actual homosexual. That's just it's not going to happen. Um, sometimes God will God will take away our desires. My dad was a drunk. He got saved, and, and he didn't have a desire to drink anymore. Well, God can sometimes do that, but God's not going to do that every single time. He can do it. Um, so you may have to struggle with things for your whole life. Never, never marry someone you don't love to have an outlet for your feelings. You see gay people try to do this. I was Christian and I knew it was wrong, so I tried to marry someone of the opposite sex so that I could maybe grow out of it. That's a little naive and immature. Um, first off, that's really not fair to your partner. Um, because they're probably thinking that they're actually getting someone who loves them. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. So that's not very fair for them, but also it's not very fair for yourself because basically what you're doing is you're acknowledging your sexual identity. I have gay, gay tendencies. And then you're completely overlooking it, and you're never going to be happy in your life because you're always going to be hiding who you really are from your spouse, trying to hide it from yourself, and it's not going to fix the problem. See what I mean?
Um, so with that being said, don't marry someone just so you, just so that you can. Oh, see, now I'll grow out of it if I just marry someone. That's that's like people who say I'll get out of pornography when I marry. No, you won't. If you're, if you're in pornography before you marry, you will stay in it after you're married. It's not going to change a single thing. Because you have to deal with your sexuality before you can overcome it. That's just a fact. This is why the Christian response of today is not okay. It is not okay to just ignore our sexuality and hope that it goes away. We are sexual beings, and the media is telling, telling people what to believe about their sexuality. The church has to be up front to, to explain things. Why is it not okay to have premarital sex? Why is it not okay to watch pornography? So, I mean, we talked about this. Let, 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 let's break this down. So you talk to somebody who, who doesn't believe in the Bible. So you can't use this because God says, okay? Why is pornography a bad thing? Well, here's a few reasons. It causes erectile dysfunction. It causes abuse in relationships. These are facts. These are not things I'm pulling out of thin air. These are, these are facts. It encourages sex trafficking. In fact, the porn industry is behind a lot of sex trafficking because there's a desire for it. If people weren't watching pornography, that people wouldn't be getting sold as sex slaves. <laughs> you can literally start this sex industry. Um, but anyways, I mentioned a great example of how you can use reason to show that these things are still wrong even if you don't believe in this book. See what I mean? It's still immoral. So, um, but with that being said, you are still responsible for your actions at the end of the day. Celibacy is an option. Uh, we'll talk more about celibacy next next week, but if you have homosexual feelings and you can't, you can't come to grips with them, it's okay to stay single. It's okay. That, that is an option. Um, so, um, so then people always ask Christians, why is homosexual, homosexuality condemned so fiercely and the rest of the laws in the Old Testament completely ignored? Well, first off, that's a lack of understanding about the Old, the Old Testament law. First off, the law of the Old Testament was not given to Christians. Did you know that? It was given to the Jews. So when Jesus came, it set it aside. See what I mean? In other words, when you're reading the Old Testament laws, you can't just read it and follow it because it no longer applies to us. We're not Jews. And even if we were the best Jews in the world, we wouldn't get saved because Jesus is the only way to the Father. That means people today who follow Judaism, are they saved? No. Because how are you saved? Jesus Christ. Well, what about before Jesus? God temporarily, temporarily allowed the sacrifices to be given until the Christ would come. Galatians talks about this. But then when the seed of the promise came, Jesus, it was fulfilled. Therefore, the old works, which once pointed towards Christ coming, now point to the fact that Christ has come. See what I mean? So with that being said, um, if you truly understand the law, you'll understand how ridiculous this is. Yes, homosexuality is still, still wrong, but so are the other things. For instance, the Bible says don't get tattoos, don't cut the edges of your beards. Don't, um, there's this other thing that goes on. And that sounds like foreign until we realize how it applies in its context. Well, back then, these were ways that you uh, uh, worship to the pagan gods. You would do, do certain markings on yourselves, and you, well, so it was associated with a pagan cult. Are modern tattoos associated with a pagan cult? They can be, but they're not always. See what I mean? Well, so that kind of changes the meaning then, doesn't it? So what applies to us as Christians today, since we're not Jews, and even if tattoos were still wrong, we're still not Jews, and so we don't have to follow that? How, what, what still applies to us? Don't worship other gods, and don't follow the world in worshiping other gods. For instance, you guys remember when iPhone came out? The, the God incarnate, I swear. And if you had it, you were in, in the groove, and if you didn't... <laughs> Yeah, you're not. <laughs> or the before the iPhone was the Razor. Oh my gosh, the <laughs> Motorola Razor. And that boy, that was a that was a cool stuff right there. But anyways, um, so uh, I mean that still applies. It still applies. You just can't read it in the same way. The law was given to Israel, not to us. Just talked about this. We must discover the principles of the Old Testament and see God's design behind them, and then carry it over. For instance, how does it apply to the, that the Jews could not have homosexual relations? Well, that actually translates over pretty well. First off, because it's clarified in the New Testament by Jesus himself um, and Paul. Excuse me. But also uh, because the purpose behind that verse is the exact same. God's design for, for sexuality is between a man, one man and one woman. I mean, that hasn't changed. Even, well, Jesus came. That still hasn't changed. See what I mean? So... Um, <clears throat> Homosexuality is still immoral. This is verified by the Old and the New Testament. 
Um, even though we are free from the law, right and wrong is still right and wrong. We are free from the Old Testament law. We are free from it. But that doesn't mean that wrong is now suddenly not wrong anymore. It just means that now we're held to a different law, the law of love. If you read Galatians and Romans here, he talks about this, and I talked about this already to great lengths. Homosexuality is another sin, not the greatest of sins. I think that that really needs to be pounded in because there's this there's this homoph homophobic idea that's gotten into the church where there's all these sins, and then there's like homosexuality, which is like that's just that's just beyond and over, you know. And, and, if you're homosexual, I mean, there's just no hope for you. You might as well just give up on life. And that's definitely not what the Bible uh, teaches. So what if you are gay and married? This is actually a good question. I want you guys to, to, to deal with this question. What if somebody is gay, they're married to another gay person, and they are saved? What should they do? Keeping in mind that God hates divorce, what do you do? And what do you tell them to do? Don't ever really jump to, and jump to and jump to say something at once. <laughs> Even more confusing. What if you have kids? How? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys are so serious. Gosh. <laughs> no, no, no. Ah, don't say that. God. <laughs> Well, I think they have to think about why they got married in the first place. Was it because they, I mean, obviously, it probably wasn't because they wanted what God promised in marriage. Mm -hmm. It was more so probably something kind of shallow. Okay. And, Could you elaborate a little more about what um, you mean by shallow? Doing it for the looks. Okay. I mean, because they thought that, you know, they were gay and that the thing to do at the time was to get married. I mean... That's actually some good thoughts, yeah. Anybody else have something to add to that or, or, or their own ideas? I want to add on to that. Yeah, go ahead. Sometimes they do it because everybody else is doing hmm. it. They get married because, oh, this person got married. Getting sucked into the bandwagon? Surely not. <laughs> iPhone, hello! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sierra, I didn't know you were listening. <laughs> oh my gosh. One thing I would say is... <laughs> God's definition of marriage is different. Elaborate on what you're saying. I know exactly what you're it's going It's between to... a man and a woman, and it is a promise made before God, and therefore, according to God's definition of marriage, that is not real marriage. It actually, that's exactly, where I was that, that's exactly what's on the, on the sheet right here. Watch. Um, um, got, uh, gay marriage is not a marriage before God's eyes. It, it, it's not. It's not a legitimate marriage. It's like I can marry a man, I can, a, a mouse. I can marry a mouse. That, that doesn't mean that it's a legitimate marriage. So I mean, I'm a pastor. I, I legitimately could marry myself to, to, to a mouse. But I mean, that wouldn't make it a legitimate. You don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, they carry disease. I don't even want to know how that would go. They'll poop everywhere. W would you have like a like a human mouse hybrid or no? I'm just I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm back on topic. Uh, but yes, that, that, was, that was actually one of the things. Is um, So if you are married to a same sex, a, a gay marriage, um, I would highly encourage a legal divorce. But once again, this is going to resolve itself already. Because a lot of the times when you get saved and you're, okay, I'm, I, I can't partake of this. Let's say Chuck and I are married. Chuck, I, I, I can't do this anymore because I think that it's wrong morally. Well, is he going to be okay with continuing to be my husband or wife, whichever one you decided to be? Uh, sorry, uh, a bad joke. I'm sorry. Um, uh, if I'm distancing myself from him, well, probably not. I mean, Paul talks about this too. If you're married with an unbeliever, what do you do? Well, I mean, you're, this is obviously between a man and a woman, not between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. But... If they're willing to live with you, you say, and if, and, if, if, and if they leave, that's okay because, once again, they're not equally yoked. We already kind of talked about that before, though. But, um, anyways, so if, if, you're, if it's a same-sex marriage, I, I, would, I would encourage divorce and stop having uh, homosexual sex. Um, what some people do is, is, and we'll talk about this in a second, but, oh, no, I'll just wait to say that. Um, if, you are, um, if you are gay and you're, and you're married, but you're married to someone of the opposite sex, but you've been like a private homosexual, um, I would encourage you to make the choice to love your spouse past your feelings. 
even if you're not attracted to them, I would encourage you to stick it out. Um, even, I mean, even if they know if they know that you're, you're not attracted to them, I would encourage both of the people to, to stick it out and try to try to make things work. Because once again, marriage isn't about looks. Like, let's say, okay, let's say Trump's wife, Melania Trump, right? Uh, everybody agrees she's she's an attractive woman, right? Let's say she gets burned head to toe. I mean, it, it, she just looks nasty. Should he divorce her? Well, no, because once again, the looks, that's not why you marry someone. And looks come and go. We talked about this. You have a 20, 25-year prime of your life, and everything just goes downhill from there. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> so, um, I mean, it, it can, it, I'm sure, I'm sure that, I'm sure that it would be difficult. But I have known some people who actually were able to, to start filling things for their spouse you know, I, ha I have known it to happen. So, um, but God does hate divorce, so that's why I would encourage if it's opposite sex and, and, and you were a private you know, homosexual, I would encourage you guys to stay together because God definitely does hate divorce. But obviously if it's gay marriage, it's not really marriage in God's eyes. It's only legal by the state, not by God. Anyways, a moral failure does not mean a anything goes. What people try to do is they say, oh, I already messed up. So that makes sense? I'll give you an example. Um, you have homosexual uh, temptations. Oh well, I'm already I'm already being tempted, so I'm going to go ahead and just look at look at gay pornography. I'm already looking at gay pornography, so I'm going to go have sex with gay men. I'm already having sex with gay men, so I'm going to have gay sex with a lot of gay men at the same time. Orgies is what they're called. Um, see what I mean? It, just because you are sinning does not mean that anything goes. If you are sinning. Consciously make the effort to hold back the tide of as to the tide of sin. Let's say, for instance, you are looking at pornography. You know it's wrong, but you can't stop yourself. Okay. Consciously realize I need to switch to cartoon porn right now. Why is it any worse? Well, I'm, it's still the attitude of lust, but it's the idea of not winning necessarily right now, but eventually you'll win. See what I mean? Planning for the future. I might be messing up now. But it won't always be messing up. Okay, you are having a gay sex with someone. Perfect example, and you know you're not gonna just stop and walk away. So don't have gay sex with another person that same night. See what I mean? Just because you sin does not give you an excuse to sin more. Does that make sense? I know that sounds a little bit confusing, um, but it's like this. Speaking of speaking of the devil. <laughs> just kidding. Didn't want the recording to pick that up. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Michelle didn't laugh. She's like, "That's not funny, Michael." <laughs> Anyways, um, but you understand what I'm saying? Like, if you're messing up, that doesn't mean that. You, and if you've done this, you know what I'm talking about. I'm already looking at porn, so it's okay if I have sex behind my wife's back or with somebody else. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Where it's like, we don't realize even that we necessarily say it, but, but nevertheless it's in the back of our minds where, where we give ourselves clearances to do more wicked things because we know that we're doing something wicked. For instance, um, there, was, there was this person who was um, living with someone that they weren't married to, you know, obviously having sex and everything. Um, and because of that, eventually they started doing things, other things that, that they knew was wrong, you know. Uh, lying and stuff and doing all these other little things and they they knew it was wrong but they still did it why because when we give ourselves over to one sin we have this idea that now anything goes because i messed up here now anything goes and well i think i'm just going to leave it at that because I, I don't want to say anything more that you guys are going to get mad at me for but i understand what i'm saying that it, just because you mess up doesn't mean you should go for the full nine yards so Anyways, uh, we'll pick up next week talking about a few different things. First off, celibacy, um, staying single, and uh, that. And we're going to talk about masturbation too. Um, and I wanted to wait to talk about masturbation until we were talking about the single life because we're going to look at masturbation, how it applies to married people and single people, um, and whether it's whether it's wrong and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we're going to look at um, we're going to start looking at the underlying problems of greed, lust, and uh, pride, and how you truly overcome something. Because what we do is we look at the surface thing that we're doing, right? I'm 
So I, I'm short-tempered. And then we try to work on that surface thing. But the truth is, a lot of times there'll be other things deeper in us that we're overlooking, and that's just how it's showing itself in our lives. So we're going to talk about next week how, how, to, how to really start looking at those deeper things, you know, and, and, and anyways. Any questions before I stop the recording? Comments? Go ahead. Just kind of as a comment, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, did anybody get uncomfortable when I was talking about gay marriage, penis, vagina? Did anybody get awkward, feel awkward when I was doing that? Yeah? Maybe a little bit by show of hands. Who felt awkward when I did that? Yeah. 